because as part of my job, and I'm sure you guys as master gardeners too, people don't usually come to me and say, my garden looks great. Um, I'm doing everything right. Uh, everything looks beautiful. Uh, just, you know, thank you for being there. No, I get, the, I get the bad and the ugly. I don't get the good so much. I am catering this talk specifically to talk about plants that handle those really rough environments. Um, and I'm going to start out with kind of a case study. And I'll come back to this at the end. So I'll, I'll bring this image back. This is actually a, a master gardener property down near Tillman. And when she bought this house, this is kind of what the yard looked like. Um, you see there's that, that big river right in the middle of the property. That was all drainage from neighboring properties. And because the water was so much, they actually had to dredge this little ditch through the property. This is the middle of the property. Um, to make sure that it drained out to the water. And, you know, just as an added bonus for a challenge, it was also mixed brackish and fresh. So it was a little bit of a um, conundrum. And you can see that the soil underneath uh, a lot of the loblolly pines doesn't, doesn't look great. There, there's nothing covering it. Uh, in fact, in some areas, it was just bare soil. Um, and whether that was due to the shade of the loblolly is the fact it was acidic, the soil, we don't know, but you can pretty much guess that these are tough spaces, right? These don't look ideal. And here are some more um, probably very familiar uh, images for you guys. A, a lot of ditches around here, right? And a lot of them get dredged, whether that's um, on purpose or not. But some of them are, are very bare. Uh, there's, there's no soil. Um, they, they clear them out just to keep the debris away and so that, the, that there's proper drainage. And of course, we've had a lot of rainfall, so this soggy turf is probably a very familiar image. Um, and, and it might be a low spot or a place where turf really wasn't the ideal uh, plant of choice or the ideal situation, but it's where it's growing. Um, and then, of course, we have really harsh environments, such as the beach, acetate, um, that has these very sandy dunes, but there are native plants growing there. There are things that are thriving, uh, and in fact, almost prefer these kinds of conditions. So, so I know that tough spaces aren't just a lost cause. There's got to be a, a way to work with them and, and to find plants that not only like those locations, but actually thrive in them. And I know you, I, I'm preaching to the choir. Why native plants? Um, I, of course, I have all good things to say about native plants um, being adaptable. And most importantly, I, I think they're beautiful as well as adaptable. Uh, but more importantly, they're biologically diverse and they contribute back to our environments. We have a lot of ornamental plants, which are great, and I'm by no means demonizing them. Um, but for me, I like a plant that serves multi-purpose. I want it to do as much as possible um, in our spaces. And so these native plants are really good at giving back to the environment uh, and supporting those native pollinators and uh, soil health and all of those things. So. Uh, and also the key is low maintenance, because that's the other thing that I never hear when people come to me is, I would like to do more maintenance. How, <laughs> how can I achieve that? So, so of course the objective is to do as little work as possible. And I admit freely, I am a lazy gardener, okay? I don't want to have to do a lot of work. I got a toddler and a husband, which is basically like the same thing. So I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time um, to deal with my yard all the time. So I like to choose things that I can get work done very quickly. And you know, I'm a visual person, so I, I tried to include as many photos as possible. I'm not a photographer, but most of these do belong to me, so I apologize if they aren't you know, ideal. But we've got uh, some mountain laurel on the left. That's a plant that really thrives in like sandy soil, very, very acidic environments. Um, and bonus, the deer don't eat it. I don't talk about wildlife eating uh, these plants a lot because that, that's just a whole nother topic. Um, and it would greatly reduce the list of plants you could use if I had to talk about deer. Um, but these are one of the, that's one of those plants that the deer do not eat. It's poisonous um, to cloven hood hooved animals. Um, and then on the top right here, we have button bush, which uh, does really well in very soggy environments. And I know everybody here has got a soggy environment because we're out on the eastern shore. So it's something that really does well in high organic soils, clay soil, all, all sorts of different soils. And um, it does wet really well. 
And I also put a swamp milkweed up here, and that's another one that, that does really well in soggy environments. But it can also handle periods of drought, which is why it's such a popular rain garden plant. But I also um, came to discover that it has a pretty wide adaptable range for pH. It can adapt from a pH of 5 to 8, which is a fairly large range. And then I found a, a plant that I don't have a picture of up here, um, Trescanthia, which is spiderwort. It can stand a pH range of four to eight. So, you know, those are the types of characteristics you want to be looking for when you're looking for tough plants, um, things that are really adaptable. Um, of course, we talk about pH all the time, and we talk about the ideal range between, being between 6.2 and 6.8. So, to have something that goes from four to eight, oh, that's pretty impressive. It's, that's a tough plant. All right, here, here's another one of my case studies. Um, this is off, off of a road uh, to my house. It's, it's over kind of by the Easton Airport. It's a really tough looking environment to, at first. All right, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get in a little bit deeper. So this is kind of like the first glance. It's probably a very acidic environment. I haven't tested the soil, but I can be assured. It's pretty sandy, actually, of all things. Um, lots of loblollies at first, the grass, no turf, um, it doesn't grow very well here. Um, unfortunately, I took this photo a couple weeks ago, so they had already cut down broom sedge, but there are a couple of native grasses that, that will grow up there in the summer if they don't mow them first. Um, and then quite a few oaks, uh, a lot of oak seedlings as well, so I know that those oaks must be really happy in that environment. Um, but maybe not impressive at first, and this, by the way, hasn't really been um, touched or modified at all except for mowing. And then we look a little deeper. This is the exact same spot, by the way. Um, I looked in between the loblollies that are growing along that edge, and there's a bunch of these native azaleas, the pinkster bloom azaleas, which are blooming right now, by the way, so keep your eyes open, but also on the road. Don't, don't look around and drive. Maybe park, park the car or pull off to the road. Um, Lots of pinkster bloom azaleas, which are beautiful. It's our beautiful native azalea that often gets forgotten for some of the commercial types. It also has a beautiful smell. Um, and then this is just lichen. Uh, you know, most people are looking for ways to get rid of moss and lichen out of their properties. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering why, because you don't have to mow this. Um, you don't have to mow it, and it's it's a beautiful color. I know I'm kind of losing the color with the with the light, but it's a, a very pale green. Um, you don't have to mow it, uh, and it's not particularly wet. It, it soaks up a lot of that water as well, so it's kind of spongy. So it's a very soft texture. And then I looked even um, deeper, and the picture on the right is, is blueberries. So the, those are blueberry blossoms. Um, and I thought the picture on the left was also blueberries, but I did a little bit more investigation, and I think it's actually a native Lakothoe, um, which is actually not in that genus anymore. I think it's called Eubotrys or something. It, uh, they changed the genus name, but it, it's a native type of Leucothoe um, that I've never seen before, but it loves, it's also called fetter bush. That's a, a, the common name. It loves acidic environments. So between the azaleas, the fetter bush, and the blueberries, you know, you can kind of deduce that this is not an ideal pH. This is going to be low, low, low. But we can kind of amplify those plants that we desire and amplify the plants that we find um, and, and love that situation and maybe just use more of them. So for me, it's just taking lessons from nature and trying to um, mimic her in, in what she's doing and, and proliferate that. Here's another pretty tough environment. This is out at Pickering Creek, just outside of Easton. Uh, very wet. And not just because it rained a lot last year. Even aside from last year, it's usually pretty wet, very swampy. Um, but this is winter, and again, I'm losing some of the color, but the colors, even in winter to me, are very striking. You know, I'm not sure why everybody cuts down their perennials in the fall, because then they miss out on this wonderful structure and color all winter long. And this, these plants are growing in a swamp, so you know they're pretty tough. They're going to handle wet. So if you're worried about more rain coming this year, um, you know, look to wetland plants. Look to plants that can handle a little bit of wet and dry. Um, we've got some of our um, soft rushes in there, Juncus romarius, um, some Andropogon virginicus, and then this picture on the right is actually wool grass, and we'll talk about that because that made my list and it even made the presentation. 
I really, I really enjoy this graphic, so I have to share it. Um, like I said, I'm a very visual person. Uh, it's a, it makes an incredible argument for why we don't necessarily like turf grass, or it might not apply to the landscape in the ways we want. Um, look at those incredible root systems of those native prairie plants. Uh, now we aren't prairie, we're meadow, but a lot of these species translate. So um, just think about that when, when you're trying to revert some of your lawn, is what a significant amount of benefits you're doing uh, by planting native plants. This is another study that I'm very fond of, and you're able to find it online. It's a Doug Tallamy study. And it really drives home, I think, the emphasis on how native uh, plants support um, a lot of our insect species. And this is just a short list, uh, but you can find the entire study online. Oh, is it on? That's right. Just oh, cool. Okay. Um, you can find the entire study online, so you can find all this data in an Excel spreadsheet, which is what I did because I love looking this stuff up. And you can go um, to pretty much any plant species in the mid-Atlantic, and that includes native plant species and non-natives. So you'll see here, oaks serve the highest purpose. So this is number of lepto lepidopteran species supported by plant species. So just in oaks, 534 number of lepidopteran insects are supported by that. So that's the fam the caterpillar butterfly family. Yeah. So we are we haven't even accounted for some of the other orders of insects. So that's that's pretty incredible to begin with. Um, and then of course on the perennial side, uh, asters and goldenrods are far the the top of the list, and then it starts to drop down. Um, just to, just to quiz you guys, and I think you'll you'll kind of guess where I'm going with this. How many Lepidopteran species do you think crepe myrtles support? Zero. <laughs> Someone said zero. That's pretty close. It's three. How about boxwoods? <laughs> boxwoods support one, and it's actually a pest. <laughs> so it's not exactly a, a desirable. How about Nandina? Ah, oh, good. I'm, I'm glad everybody's disgusted with Nandina. Me too. It's zero. Zero, um, zero lepidopterans are supported by Nandina, and that's all from that Doug Tallamy study. So I, I know you kind of see where I'm going with this, why our native plants are such a crucial part of the biological key. Um, so anyways, just a, just a little bit of numbers for you. Let's see if this will work. Let's see. So this, this is a little video that I took on my property, and um, Again, it's a good thing I'm good with plants because I'm, I'm not a videographer. But this is mountain mint, a native mountain mint. And you'll see just from the movement how much bee and insect activity um, is present on those plants. This is a 30 second video and I captured all of this. Um, and it's not a very large plot either. So a lot of bumblebees, a lot of wasps and uh, butterflies, skippers. So, it's a nice visual reminder of what we're shooting for. So we talk about how plants support pollinators. This is supporting pollinators. You can actually see it, physically hear it and see it. And why are we worried about tough spaces or why are we worried about our plants in the environment? Well, you can pretty much be reassured that erratic weather patterns and anomalies are going to continue to be an issue. Um, especially out here on the coast. Uh, we're going to get more extreme extremes, which means higher amounts of heat, longer drought periods, excessive rainfall um, in, in certain periods, invasive species presser, pressure. I know you guys are all wise to this, um, but again, I'm just trying to drive this point home. And then, of course, pest and disease frequency is going to be increasing as well, and we're going to have to adapt and have a biologically diverse environment to make sure that not one species is being taken out. And this is a little um, graph I just used. This is not enough data to say significance, um, statistically speaking. But you can see that that trend in the last uh, 20 years is the rainfall is going up. And you can see those extreme spikes, which happen once in a while. We have years of excessive rainfall. But that little steady line is the average, and it's climbing. Um, so you know, water's going to be an issue. All right, now we get to the good stuff. We get to talk about the plants themselves. Uh, so what's the measure of a tough plant? What do I mean by that? And uh, what I like to say is I like a plant that checks all of the boxes. It's a plant that likes 
full sun to full shade. Um, it can handle any environment, uh, you know, clay to sandy soils, wet to dry. Um, it might have salt tolerance and it's self-sustaining, so something that will perpetuate either, you know, it uses rhizomes to spread or seeds, so something that will continue to proliferate. But I'm also going to emphasize that it has a wildlife factor or an ecological contributor, so it, it provides food or habitat or some kind of benefit to our native species. Um, and then an attractive landscape quality because, you know, we still have to look at something pretty, right? So we need something with a little bit of seasonality, whether that means it has multiple seasons that it's beneficial or that it looks beautiful. Um, flowers, berries, fall color, um, color or shape, or even fragrance might be one of those attractive landscape qualities. So that's the measure of a tough plant. And we get to the good stuff here. Anybody who knows me knows I'm crazy about native grasses. So you might see some grasses in here. And one of the quotients I'll explain here is I've put a little quotient for aggressive behavior. Um, and I say aggressive, not invasive, because it, it's not an invasive species. It doesn't overtake an entire area. Um, it has aggressive behavior, so it will um, proliferate very well. It will continue to seed itself. And broom sedge is kind of a, a, a medium aggressive behavior. It'll show up in fallow fields. It'll show up in places where uh, you stop mowing. Uh, but it's not aggressive like, like some other, it's not like English ivy where it will take over an area. It, it's still pretty tidy and you can still mow it and it'll, it'll go away. It needs to be able to get to full height. And this is a plant that can withstand anything. Um, clay, loamy, sandy soils, um, sun to part sun. I've seen it growing in shade too, so I would question that. And it does dry to wet moisture types, which is, which is good because as we get those periods of drought and rainfall, we're going to want something that can handle it. It's a great cover for wildlife. And actually my favorite season of this grass is winter because it is some of the best color in the winter when the landscape is, you know, brown or dark brown. So this is kind of a golden tan color and I just think it's a very striking plant. Um, it might not look like much in the summer, it's just going to look like a green grass, but this is where it pays off, is in winter. <coughs> and it also really likes acidic soil, so that it's got that going for it. Yeah? Well, I see the bottom of you say difficult to find slash buy seed plants. Yeah. What's the story? I think it's becoming more popular. I've actually seen it um, starting to be sold commercially. The seed is really light and fluffy, and it's hard to de beard, which means it's hard to clean. So they don't commercially sell the seed often, and if they do, it's really expensive. But I'm starting to see the plants in like planters being sold at different native plant nurseries. Um, I think Adkins just had it at their sale. Chesapeake Natives across the bridge, they have it for sale. Um, but some of the traditional commercial nurseries, I don't see it yet. But I predict native grasses, everybody's gonna get wise to it and they're gonna like it as much as I do. Um, so yes, it is, it is hard to get a hold of, but honestly, you probably don't need to buy it. If you stop mowing an area, it's going to show up, because that's what happened on my property. <laughs> oh, I don't know what happened to half of my pictures here. They disappeared. Um, panicum or switchgrass, this is another one I know you guys are familiar with. This is, I most often see wild in Dorchester County, actually, when I'm out driving. It'll grow right in those brackish ditches. It does not seem to care one way or another if there's salt water in the way. Um, and it's also really useful in living shorelines. Um, obviously, it handles a wide variety of uh, soil conditions, but it has an incredible root system that stabilizes the soil, which is kind of like the gold star, I think, of this plant um, for areas that you're dealing with erosion and you're having a tough time getting things to grow there, switchgrass might be the answer to that. But it's also very difficult to remove. So if you, if you put it in or if you plant it, just know that it might be there forever. But that means it's a tough plant. It withstands the test of time. <laughs> but it might be a little aggressive for a home garden, for a small garden. It might be better as like a conservation um, plant. Oh, I don't know why that showed up separate. There's wool grass, um, which I talked about a little bit earlier. It's got these really attractive orange seed heads, in, or rust colored seed heads in the, in the winter. Um, it's also a really tough plant, not actually a grass. It belongs to the sedge family. 
Um, incredible root system. It's a clump sedge that has a really tough root system. Grows very well in ditches. In fact, that's where I see it natively most often, is just growing in the ditches. Um, and it spreads easily by seed. It's called wool grass because the seed heads are really woolly. They look you know, very fine textured, very fuzzy, and they spread a long ways. So uh, very good for shoreline plantings, good for ditches, good for very wet areas. And bonus, it's a host plant for the Dion skipper and uh, eyed brown butterflies. And then, of course, I couldn't talk about native plants if I didn't talk about black-eyed Susan. But let me tell you um, just how tough this is. This is the roadside warrior where it's going to grow. You know that soil isn't ideal. It's right off the road. It's right off the shoulder. Um, who knows what kind of junk is there? It's got to be hot and dry. It's got to be salted. Um, and yet, this seems to thrive in that kind of environment. So if you have a tough soil, it even says it, it works well in dry, tough soils. So if that isn't a tough plant, I don't know what is. Um, it can be very short-lived in tough environments, and it might not get to the size like the cultivated varieties are. Um, but still, all the same, it is, is beautiful, and they seem to bloom really well. Um, good seasonality. And I'll bring up black-eyed Susans at the end. I have a little story about them. Golden ragwort. Some people might hate me for putting this in here. It, it is borderline aggressive, a very aggressive behavior. It's a high aggressive. Um, it says it grows in um, loamy soils, but I've seen it grow in other soil types as well, um, like clay. And this is one that goes from full sun to full shade. So that's kind of a, a, a good plant for tough environments. And it's blooming about this time of year, so it's a nice burst of yellow, um, something to kind of compete with uh, non-native varieties. So it creates a very nice um, like mat or mass planting. And it will self-seed freely, so just be aware of that. And this is another one of my favorite go-tos for people who are looking for ground cover. Um, this might be the first thing that pops into my mind because it handles full sun, full shade, uh, wet to dry and it's mostly a basil plant so it's very very low to the ground except for the one stalk of flowers that have these little cute little lavender flowers on top um, and they actually can bloom twice in a year so they'll bloom in the spring and then if you deadhead them uh, they can bloom again in the fall before winter so that's kind of a, a neat alternative it will self seed freely so I say it's like a medium to high aggressive behavior but Honestly, you know, the, the little seedlings, if I really don't want them, I just take a, a hoe and I kind of scratch it out of the soil. They're little, so they don't take too much control. A sensitive fern um, is, a, is a really good fern for tough areas that are moist and wet. Um, it does spread by rhizome, so it can kind of colonize an area. That's kind of how their behavior is, as they colonize. Um, but they make a very good ground cover in wet environments, and it's, it's really good as a competitor for areas where you've cleared of invasive species, which is another reason why I kind of favor things that are aggressive, is because we still need plants that are able to compete with areas that we're renovating or that we're clearing of invasive plants. And that's the biggest challenge, is something that can compete with those. Um, and then we have a milkweed for every environment type. Um, this is kind of cool because we have so many to choose from, uh, depending on what your area is. So the swamp milkweed would be best for like a wet environment, and you know that handles a pretty good pH range. Um, the common milkweed is really good at roadsides, so pretty dry, um, tough soil environments, maybe urban soils, it would do pretty well. Uh, and then the butterfly weed, it, it just has the best, some of the best native color you can ask for. But it also does prefer a drier environment. So this wouldn't be necessarily a, a good wetland plant. Um, but definitely they all have their own application in, in the environment. And of course, it's, it's the host plant for a monarch butterfly. And everybody seems to love monarchs. So I'd like to support that. Blue mist flower actually belongs to the mint family, which is why I give it an aggressive, like a medium aggressive behavior, because it will self-seed. But it's a long time bloomer, so it blooms for a long time. It's a fall plant. And as you can see, the, the seed head is a very bright electric purple blue. Um, and, it, 
and it will go anywhere but pretty much blazing hot sun. It'll do um, just about any soil type and, and shade to, to sun, but it doesn't like really hot sun. That's my, that's my only caveat. Um, and as you can see, really cute, this is in my property, the longhorn bees, um, they will just sit underneath the flower and they will clasp the stem with their uh, mandibles and their legs and they'll just sit there. And they'll sit there in colonies like this, like a, just a grouping of longhorn bees. They are so cute. Um, <laughs> and they have those enormous antenna. It's just, it's adorable. And they really, they really don't want to move because I would like tap the stem and they wouldn't fly away. But they'd kind of like buzz a little bit, like back off. Um, so so they, they really seem to enjoy this plant, and I'm looking forward to it this year as well. Bone set. So th there's some confusion. There's a fall flowering bone set, um, and this is different. Uh, this is Eupatorium perfoliatum. Uh, fall hyssop is the other, or hyssop thoroughwort, sorry, is the other one. And it blooms a little bit later. I actually prefer this one for the landscape. It's a little bit smaller. Um, the thoroughwort gets almost shrub-like, it's, it's very large. And the way to tell them apart is that the leaves on this one clasp the entire stem, so it, it encompasses it. The thoroughwort does not do that, it has just a, a normal um, attachment to the stem. Um, the behavior is somewhat aggressive, it'll spread, but it's not hard to pull them out. The, re the root system's really weak, but I love this plant because the pollinators uh, adore it. In the uh, video I showed you of the mountain mint, they're on this like that as well. They, they just uh, will swarm to it. And, and you get wasps, you get skippers and butterflies and bees, you get all sorts of pollinators, not just one or the other. Um, and it also has, the foliage can get like a really pretty yellow color in the fall um, and almost like an orange tinge around the edges and so it's not very often that you see a, a perennial that has that nice fall color like that. Of course chokeberry, you know it's one of our, our native edible fruits. Um, I tend to like the black chokeberry more than the red because it's smaller or the mature size is supposed to be smaller. Um, it's really good for any type of soils. It, it does clay, loamy sand, uh, but it does prefer more moist and wet environments. It says it'll handle dry. I have not tested that out because my property is not dry ever. Uh, <laughs> so it does have some range in that circumstance and it has multi-season benefits. So right now it's blooming, it's got these clusters of white flowers and then you'll get the berries in the, uh, in the summer and then the fall color as you can kind of see here, it is gorgeous, it is just that pretty. It is like an orange and red um, fall color that is just, it's wonderful. A sweet spire which is different than clethra um, but this one tends to have a little bit more range than clethra alnifolia does. Um, Itea will handle just about any soil and environment type, whereas Clethra does prefer shade and wet. Uh, this will handle dry, or yeah, it says uh, moist, but it'll handle some dry soils and it'll handle full sun as well. And it has high wildlife value. Of course, all those um, flowers smell wonderful and the pollinators just flock to them. Elderberry is another edible native fruit, just in case you're curious. Um, I often see these in very wet ditch environments. It does prefer moist to wet soils. And it often gets confused, uh, especially this past year when um, was the giant hogweed was in the news. Its flowers do look a little bit like um, that family, the, the Umbelliaceae family, but you know, people were calling me and saying they had giant hogweed. And uh, they would send me pictures and I'd be like, oh no, this is, a, this is a happy mistake. This is elderberry and you know, just so many benefits to this plant. Um, it does sucker, so it is not necessarily good for a, a landscape environment or right up next to the house, but this is really good for wet areas or low spots. And bayberry is also one of my favorite plants of all times because it just ticks all of those boxes, right? It, it doesn't have very aggressive behavior, so you know you don't have to worry about that. Handles any soil type, sun to shade, dry to wet. You're seeing the theme here. I like things that are adaptable. <laughs> and it does have fragrant flowers. It has some um, herbal uses. You know, it can be used as a substitute for bay leaf. 
um, and those those berries just they smell wonderful and it's just got a lot of uh, wildlife um, benefits as well in the eastern red cedar I might get some mixed reviews on this uh, depending on if you have crab apples or any other apple on your property <laughs> I just think this is a dynamo tree <laughs> I um, went to Jane's Island last year uh, and we paddled around the island and one of the few tree species that that actually has survived Jane's Island is a red cedar the other one's loblolly which I'll talk about later um, but junipers are incredibly tough uh, I've seen them in the driest of dry you know rock beds and I've, then I've seen them practically in standing water so you know that they can handle a lot of different environments and I forget how many species of bird feed on the berries. It's something ridiculous, like 48 different species of birds. Um, and it provides great habitat for those birds because it is so dense and it stays evergreen through the winter. So it gives them a place to retreat to from predators. Um, so a lot of good benefits to this plant. Maybe not so much if you're worried about cedar apple rust. I might get some daggers from, or dagger looks from you guys on this plant as well, but I actually really like sweet gums. They do have an aggressive uh, behavior, especially in wetland areas. They will overpopulate a wetland area, um, but they have great uh, wildlife benefits. There's actually something called a shikimic acid that they take out of the seed of this plant, and it's used in Tamiflu. So you can think the sweet gum tree. Next time you have the flu and you have to take Tamiflu, just thank the sweet gum tree because it can be used in medicine. So it's kind of one of those multifunctioning plants that will grow anywhere. Um, I actually think it has some of the most attractive fall color that I've ever seen on a tree, um, but some people might not agree with me on that. I think this is my last plant, Loblolly Pine, and I'm not sure I agree with myself on this pick, especially after the past week we've had with all the pollen, but if you can get over the pollen, get over the pollen, it does grow in just a variety of habitat types. It just seems to tolerate just about anything. Um, and, and this is one of those other plants that grows on like Jade's Island and in really harsh, exposed environments. I think it makes a better tree as a specimen tree instead of planting and mass, but it's a really important for the timber industry, which is how they plant it is very close together. But if you see this um, on its own in, the, in a landscape, it's much more full. It doesn't look as leggy and as scraggy um, as it looks in that picture. Um, so, you know, give it a chance. I, I know it produces a lot of pollen, um, but, but it still has a really good application in the environment. And this is one of my other case studies I wanted to bring up. This is, a, we have a demonstration garden on Poplar Island, uh, which is just off the coast of Tillman. And this is a harsh environment. So this is literally an island that's been built from nothing. Uh, they, they brought in dredge material, dredge material, as the soil from Baltimore Harbor. And they've literally rebuilt this island pretty much from scratch. Um, and I forget the year that they started rebuilding this, but it's come a long way. And we have this demo garden there. And you want to talk about harsh environments. Uh, we never know what we're going to find. We go there once a month from April to October. And we just never know what we're going to find, what's going to come back, what's going to survive. Um, and one of the things that has survived and been really happy about it is right in front of uh, our master gardener here kneeling is a bunch of little uh, black-eyed Susan seedlings. It's growing in straight oyster shell beds. Straight oysters, okay? Like, <laughs> it's not supposed to be there. It loves to be there. And now it's spreading everywhere. It's in between the walkways. Um, it's even growing in the cracks of these tiles. Um, so you want to talk about a tough plant? Black-eyed Susans are tough plants. And that's Maryland for you, I, I think. <laughs> Okay, and now we're back to our, our master gardener's home. Um, this was a really tough environment the first year she came. You can see there's erosion, um, there's nutrient runoff, she's got algal blooms, and there's nothing she can do about homeowners, uh, her neighbors draining onto her property. There's nothing she can do about the water. Um, so she realized it was a tough environment and she wanted to embrace it. So this is, I think, two years after she started kind of encouraging native growth. Now this isn't a finished product. This is only like two years down the line, but look at what a difference is being made. This is the exact same um, picture, or same location as in this picture, okay? Nothing. Um, and she's got water plantain, 
She's got that cardinal flower that's growing right there uh, next to the culvert. There's giant bulrush. Um, there's a bayberry there in that shot. And you might not be able to tell, but what she started to do is in those spots that were bare underneath the loblollies, she started collecting loblolly uh, pine needles and just mulching the area, just deciding that it wasn't worth leaving bare for erosion. Um, and she couldn't plant grass there because it was too shady and the ground was you know, tough. So she just started mulching it um, and then encouraging the plants in the water to grow um, as, as well as she could. Uh, so this is a really nice case study where we were able to say uh, it turned out for the better. Um, and now I, I think that's, I know I'm finished a little bit early because I was, I was worried about not getting to everything, but do you guys have any questions for me? There's more tough plants on the list. I didn't want to go through all of them, um, but if you ever have any questions, you should know where to find me. I'm in the Talbot County office. <laughs> Yes, from. What about the shrub? I don't know the shrub name, and they call it nine bark. Nine bark, yeah. Those are really tough too, um, and they come in a variety of cultivars. They're easily accessible to buy, um, so yeah, those are also a good option. They get pretty big though, um, and they can they have like that weeping habit. So you want to make sure that it's in a spot that's big enough for it. it might be tough for a small garden. Well, I have one. Yeah. In my property. We built it up a little bit. And And maybe Scott can speak to this, but I think he, he kind of drove home the point that after after it blooms, or probably, I know the default is kind of to say when it's dormant in the winter, so you aren't introducing any pests or disease issues. Yeah, half um, its yeah. feet are in water this year. Yeah. <laughs> so it's got one foot down yeah. and one foot up. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, you know, that's, that's something I'd love to hear from you guys too, is what your experiences are with tough plants. Like, is there a native plant that you know of that despite your efforts, it has not died? <laughs> that, it, that it just continues to go on no matter how much abuse you put to it. So, um, well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate you. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a question here, yeah. In the ditch that you yeah. were getting in the end, what do you plan, I mean, I've got the same situation mm -hmm. in the ditch, and when, the, when we get a downpour, it, you could run a little canoe down. Yeah. But what do you plan in the ditch to slow down the, I mean, I've got cardinal flowers, but we sort of on the side. Yeah. But do you plan in the ditch itself? So I've, even, I've seen soft rush grow straight into a ditch. A lot of the carex species, um, so a lot of the sedges will handle that. I guess my question to you is, first of all, is it along a road? Because if, you, if it's a ditch alongside the road, the county ultimately has say about how the ditch is maintained. You could invest a lot of money planting that ditch and they could come and mow it any day they wanted. Uh, but if it's on your property like this one was, then you can you know, do what you want. Also, is it seasonally inundated, or does it always have a little bit of water in it? Uh, seasonally. Seasonally, yeah. It so it's periodically dry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. When it rains, it runs. So that gives you, yeah, it gives you a little bit more to work with. Then you don't have to do straight wetland species um, that are obligate, you know, wetland kind of plants. So, um, yeah, th you could choose a whole bunch of different things, depending on what you'd want to see bloom, or if that doesn't matter to you, a lot of those carrot species will work very well, like tussock sedge, um, which is a nice tidy sedge, right. and um, the juncus uh, effusus, the soft rush, that's a nice one too. She had giant bulrush growing in hers, and that's because, that's because she had the road on one side and her house on the other, so she actually didn't want to see the road. Um, so she planted a bunch of the native cattails and then these giant bulrush just started to show up and she left them and they are like seven, eight feet tall. I mean, they're, they're tall. Um, so they help block the view. But some people don't like that because if it's between you and the water and you want to see the water, you don't want giant bulrush anyway. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. One thing I usually see attached to plant descriptions is pH. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about finding the kind of stuff that you're looking for? Where's the best source of information to find out what kind of pH 
Yeah, and you know what? With, with native plants in particular, some of that information isn't known yet. That maybe they haven't done the studies yet. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Handbook, which I hope you all have, um, the, the conservation plants for the Chesapeake Bay, they will have um, an area and the characteristics for pH range. Okay. Um, and in fact, I think that's where I found the spiderwort pH range, uh, which the you know four to eight. Most of them are pretty generous. Um, they tend to be more on the more plants are tolerant of acidity than they are of alkaline. Um, I think elderberry is one of the few that does alkaline soils. Um, but yeah, it, you'd want to check that out. Unfortunately, they don't have it for every single species, but it's probably because they just don't have that data. They just don't know yet. Nobody's tested it. Uh, yeah, so it's, in, a, in a way, I hate to say just wait and see what shows up. But in a manner of speaking, then you'll kind of know what that area supports. So when I stopped mowing part of my property, the first thing to show up was broom sedge and purple top grass. Um, so they must be able to handle pretty acidic areas. Yeah, our soil is really alkaline. Yeah. So yeah, okay, so you want to go the other way. Oh, that's why the swamp milkweed can tolerate up to eight. That's a good one. Um, yeah, you have to check that out. I don't know all of them off the top. <laughs> Any other questions here? Yeah, what well, I said is that I had a native plant that I had in a spot maybe four feet from the road or five feet from uh -huh. the road for years. Uh -huh. It died last year after it got flooded multiple times with all our rain. I think last year was an exceptional year when you think about, you know, 65 to 70 inches of rain. That was our annual rainfall. Yeah. Um, so we probably did lose a lot of specimens due to that, even though they're tough plants. Yeah, not everything can survive. Oh, sure. Okay. It was underwater. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Thank you guys so much for being a great audience. I appreciate it.